Defense will see how Vermont's food growers are soaking up the sunshine and how they're partnering with UVM Extension for energy efficiency savings through renewable energy production. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Vermont's comprehensive energy policy calls for obtaining 90% of our re energy from renewable resources by the year 2050. Well, further, the policy seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from a 1990 baseline. Vermont's food producers are helping advance those goals with assistance from University of Vermont Extension. Keith Silva tells us more from Old Athens Farm in Putney. Springtime is when greenhouses across Vermont become engine rooms of vegetable production. To stoke the fire, so to speak, takes fuel. Lots and lots of fuel. I'm Mike Collins at the Old Athens Farm and I grow a half acre of greenhouse vegetables. Many of my greenhouses are heated so I'm always looking for good ways to heat them and socially responsible ways to heat them. I'm often burning sawdust in here and along with my wood. And From wood to waste oil, Collins has tried several fuel sources with differing degrees of success. When I started farming, uh, my greenhouses were heated entirely with wood. It got a little old waking up every three hours every day in the winter time and uh, firing up four or five wood stoves. Um, but then I moved on to a wood boiler, which was a little more efficient, but I still needed this oil backup. So throughout my whole farming career, I've really relied on alternative energy, if you can call wood an alternative energy in Vermont. For many, it's always been there. I've always looked for ways to heat with materials that I don't have to purchase. So how's that solar project going, Mike? Well, it's going pretty well overall. In 2010, Collins began to work with University of Vermont Extension to develop a solar hot water heating system that would be used to warm the soil in the winter months. It's always better to have bottom heat for many of the seedlings and in my, when I have vegetables in the ground, they really like a warm, warm soil. Every BTU of heat that goes into the greenhouse, regardless of where it goes, into the ground or into the air, is, comes, comes back to you in your pocketbook and in energy savings. So this is a way to put this heat and store it in the ground and have it in the greenhouse so even on the coldest winter nights I'm not burning as much propane and during the spring and uh, early summer when believe it or not we're still heating I really don't have to rely very much at all on the uh, propane heat. This project cost twenty thousand dollars. Collins paid for half of it. The rest was financed through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture courtesy of a grant from the Rural Energy for America program, REAP for short. This is a project that was uh, fairly expensive to implement and certainly one that I, I would not have undertaken myself. I've always um, been doing the wood projects myself, the wood boilers and, and these other waste oil projects because I'm able to get a return in, in, in a much uh, shorter period of time on something like a wood boiler, which almost pays for itself in a year, or a waste oil furnace, which pays for itself in two years or three years. But the solar panel project here is the kind of thing that's going to pay for itself maybe in 10 years, maybe even longer, who knows. Collins has made a few changes to the system since it was installed. He gets approximately 10 million BTUs of solar energy, or the equivalent of 110 gallons of propane. With the current cost of propane, he estimates he saved about $350 or more this winter. Savings aside, for Collins, this project has never been about short-term gains. Whether the price of propane is down right now or going up later and the price of oil is still up, uh, having, having a system where I don't have to rely on uh, these fossil fuels or where I don't have to buy in fuel, um, where I either I can cut wood or buy wood, it's a lot cheaper for me than using fossil fuels. And this, every year, is kind of free. And um, at least it's a set price that I'm paying every year in my capital investment, whereas uh, if I'm buying propane or if I'm buying oil, I'm giving this money to the gas company and uh, I don't get the, that money back and I have no idea how much it's going to cost me every year. In the Northeast, sunshine can come at a premium. For Mike Collins, that means making hay, uh, energy, 
and saving money when the sun shines. In Putney, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Keith. Joining me now is agricultural engineer Chris Callahan from UVM Extension. Thanks for being with us. Tell me about how this that system that we just saw works. So this, it's a solar hot water collector, and so the, the panels that you saw are absorbing the uh, energy from the sun and putting it into water and raising the temperature of the water, mm -hmm. and then that water can be used to heat uh, a, another space. And so he's actually using it as pipes underneath the greenhouse, is that correct? That's right, pipes underneath the greenhouse and then also some radiators along the perimeter of the greenhouse. Yeah. And why did he decide on that system? So Mike uh, has, as you heard, has uh, been experimenting with alternative heating sources of a lot of different kinds for, for several, year, several years. And um, this was another opportunity to explore something different. You know, he's tired of uh, st uh, stoking the fire mm -hmm. in, in the boilers. Um, so this is a way of making that a little less management intense. It's a big project, though. It is a big project uh, and, an, and a, a high capital uh, project to begin with. Um, so, you know, and, and that's where uh, Extension has uh, helped Mike out in terms of, and, and the um, funding support, mm -hmm. um, in terms of understanding the, the engineering and the system layout and how it, how it can work. So how does this solar system that we just saw differ from the solar panels that we see in big fields as we drive around? Yeah, right. So most of the solar panels you see as you drive around the state are uh, photovoltaic. They're making electric, um, uh, en uh, electric power. And so that they, they tend to be attached to the grid, the electric grid, and so mm -hmm. that power gets sold to us as, as consumers. Um, what Mike's done is really developed a very localized solar energy uh, system um, that uses hot water um, to transfer the energy instead of el el electricity. And so Mike also talked about his motivation of not using fossil fuels. How important are non-financial motivators in adopting these kinds of technologies? It, it's been interesting to see them become more and more important in, in the, uh, among the people I work with. Um, there are always these systems always need to pencil out on their own on, in financial terms uh, in one way or another. But um, a lot of the farmers that I've worked with are starting to also then season that assessment with what are the other benefits or what are, what are the other risks that are being mitigated. In Mike's case, it's not, it, as he noted, it's not just whether it's cheaper, but the predictable nature of his energy. Uh, th that he's obtained. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because when it comes to farming, I mean, every penny counts. And you, you have to de depend on the weather, obviously, mm -hmm. to produce your crops. Mm -hmm. But then throw any other variable in and it can just totally throw you off. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge factor. You know, any little bit of um, certainty or at least better predictability that you can get is, is helpful. And um, so that's a lot of what a lot of the discussions I've been having um, with farmers has, has focused on what, what uh, variables can I remove or at least better understand. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit too about extending the growing season. I mean obviously if you're in the middle of winter heating a greenhouse you're, you're hoping to grow product. Right, so um, wh whether it's winter growing or even early spring or late fall growing um, uh, there's a tremendous um, uh, move towards season extension that is growing at uh, times of year when we historically have not. Um, as well as storing uh, food um, in periods when we're not necessarily growing. Um, so he, strong market demand for uh, locally or regionally produced foods um, all, all year long is, is driving that. And so what are some of the other systems that you've been working on at other farms? I mean, this was one idea we saw earlier, um, you know, a biomass heater. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that farmers are sort of coming up with and trying? So a, a good place to look at some other success stories, if you will, is um, a project of the uh, Vermont Farm to Plate Network. Um, I serve on the energy cross-cutting team within that network. And our team's made up of uh, partners from the Agency of Agriculture, uh, Efficiency Vermont, the Vermont Bioenergy Initiative, and, and, and others. And one of the things we've started to do is collect these success stories in um, two-page documents that are sort of easy to get at and, and understand and, and see the, see the, um, the systems um, uh, easily. And those can be found at uh, the Vermont Farm to Plate Network, um, and they're downloadable uh, files, and, uh, or people can contact me directly for copies. They include things like um, the biomass uh, greenhouse heating example that, that we've uh, seen, um, as well as solar photovoltaic on a dairy farm, so making electric power from, from the sun on a dairy farm, mm -hmm. energy efficiency case studies in the dairy farm, as well as dairy processing. So. And so um, obviously, too, there are different success stories for different products that people are producing. What are some of the other sort of food products that maybe 
your your research has helped out. Right. Yeah. It's it's pretty much anything um, <laughs> anything you can think of. Um, w we are seeing a lot more value added production uh, that is taking raw uh, agricultural products and turning them into um, a more value a higher value product. So. Um, things like cheese mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, um, or uh, cured meats, for example, um, even uh, mixed vegetable products, um, which require a little bit more um, technology at times mm -hmm. than, than you might think, uh, and uh, certainly maintaining safe food systems and high quality, low, and, um, low cost. Can you approaches. give me some examples of some of the, the things that, that farmers have done to sort of bridge that gap and, and to accomplish those goals? Well, one thing that's happening is, is certainly the existence of the food hubs in Vermont. So um, there are several around the state. And these are places where um, f farmers or other food uh, entrepreneurs um, can, can go to convert some of these raw products into, um, into uh, value-added products, um, um, soups or um, you know, cured meats or cheeses. Um, Mm -hmm. and I know that too. You've, you've worked on a humidifier project when you're talking about cheese. Yeah. So um, one of the things I found is our the, the scale of production in Vermont uh, mm -hmm. and a number of these food um, products is kind of in between what you might do at home or in a small cottage industry and um, more uh, lar larger scale commercial production. And it's a it's a, a segment of the, the industry that's not well served in terms of available products, and so people are looking to control conditions, whether it's temperature or humidity, in some of these production areas or processing areas. And so one of the things that I found was needed was a a, um, a smaller scale humidification system, but something that's a little bit better than what you and I might use in our home to keep the humidity up. Mm -hmm. So we we developed something to do that. Also, too, I know that you've done some work with um, growing hops. Mm -hmm. And because that's sort of a new crop that maybe could be a value-added crop for some farmers, but there are some issues with growing it and harvesting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the, the main barriers to uh, broader adoption of hops production or reintroduction of hops production in our region mm -hmm. has been how to harvest. And, uh, you know, manually harvesting hops is pretty tedious um, and uh, time intense. And so um, working uh, with some of my colleagues within Extension and some hop growers themselves, we developed a, uh, hops, a mechanized hops harvester that uh, really speeds that process up. Because hops grow, if you, I've never, if people don't understand, they grow up. Mm -hmm. So they're huge, almost strings of hops, yeah. and you have to cut those down to harvest and then hand pick them. Right, so about 20 feet in length, uh, they can grow uh, as tall as 20 feet. And what we're after is really just the cones. And you can, people are probably familiar with like a, um, a grapevine. Mm -hmm. And so you, most of it is, is leaves, and then you just want the fruit. And so hops are even more more uh, significant than that. There's just a little cone you're after. Um, so you need to hunt through the leaves and get the cones and be careful picking them because you can damage them. Um, so uh, being able to do that mechanically is a significant cost savings and, and also really enables a larger scale production. So going from above one acre hop mm -hmm. yards is really limited unless you have a mechanical harvester. Mm -hmm. And this is something that can go from farm to farm? It is, yeah. It's on a trailer, so it's portable. And um, each year we, we get to about six or seven different farms. So now that you've got these projects going, what happens now? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, our, our role with an extension is to, to uh, put research-based knowledge to work. And so a lot of what we're doing is helping university-based research uh, reach the community. Um, but the other thing that happens is a lot of inquiry comes from the community to help inform further research or um, exploration. So uh, yeah, I'm constantly getting uh, inquiries from farms and, and other food system participants about um, is it possible to do X, Y, or Z? Mm -hmm. and, uh, or I want to do this, what are my best options, or can you, can you help me? Uh, find a way to do that. So it's the sky's the limit, really. Um, there's there's tremendous. Um, it's a tremendously dynamic time for food systems in Vermont and New England, and uh, I'm really excited about how technology can be leveraged to to support that. And if people want to get in touch with you or find out about these products, what should they, they should do? Um, so we I have a uh, website on the uh, that's part mm -hmm. of the extension website, and uh, that'd be the best way. All of my contact information is there. Mm -hmm. It's good reading, too. I've been looking through this. A lot of interesting things going on. Great. Thank you. I want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Judy. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.